interval. Uh, we've been getting loads of tweets through from you, so thank you very much uh, tonight for those. And um, lots going to Mr. Davis. And the first, Steve, is from Christopher Veer, who says, I'd like to know about the snooker stands, please, Steve. I've been told I'm a bit too hunched up Ooh. when I'm playing. Please, can you help me? Well, Christopher, I don't know if, uh, how keen you are on the game, but you can go down your local hardware store, buy some white tape. OK, this line here is the line of the shot, OK? This is a line at 90 degrees. This is a line roughly 60 degrees. I'm not going to argue. I haven't got a protractor, OK? <laughs> not in the cue case. Put this heel, this foot, on the line of the shot. Put the other heel at the, on the 60-degree line, OK? Keep your right leg straight, your left leg bent, and all of a sudden, that is roughly the position to get down into the balls. OK, this distance apart could be a problem. If this is too close, you might look a bit hunched and a bit crunched up. Or if this foot is in front, sometimes that can look a bit strange. Perhaps shoulder length apart. Perhaps that, that distance, shoulder length apart. Because what you're trying to do is to spread the load and the weight of your body. So, shoulder length you've got it all covered, then you've got a nice solid stance. That's about the best I can manage without seeing you personally. Uh, Dr Davis only has surgeries, I think, on a Monday and a Thursday. I can't <laughs> remember what it is. Next question, please, Hayden. Oh, never mind, Dr Davis. It looks like a uh, crime scene for Stickman over there with all your tape. Uh, what is the best way, says Andrew Scott, to become more consistent with the rest and to ensure straight queuing with it? Well, probably the best way to, is to keep playing with the rest as much as you can. You know, keep playing frames and frames and frames with it from every position. But the most important thing about the rest is this end is replicating your bridge. These are plastic feet. They're not gripping like a, a, the bridge would do. So you, when you put this on the floor like this, on the, on the cloth, you've got to try and make sure this end doesn't float around in the air so the, on, the, on the cloth. So the only way you can do that is by pushing down on the butt, butt end as hard as you can to make it as solid as possible. The next trouble is keeping this cue in a straight line because it's a different art position for your arm. The only way you're going to do that is by keep on playing. You can't just do it overnight. Just keep on playing until you can groove that action. And the last tip, it's a bit te technical, but OK, when you're going to hit the white ball, look at the red. Keep that red in your face, look at the red, and then whack it through like that. Nice, Steve. Keep your head still as well. <laughs> it's, it's, mm. it's Saturday night, Steve. Let's not get too technical. Come on. Um, and the next one's from Paul Thorne, but I suspect it might be Willie, who says, what practice routine would you recommend for a player of reasonable ability to sharpen up their skills? Well, uh, talking to Stephen Hendry uh, the other day about uh, what he used to do in his peak, um, put one red on the table, pot the red, pot the black. When you've done that, put two reds on the table, pot two reds, two blacks, three reds, Three reds, three blacks, four reds. The moment you miss, you go back to one red and start again. But there you go. He was a masochist, Stephen Hendry. <laughs> but that's great practice. That puts pressure on. You want to get as far as possible and see what your personal best is. How far can you go through the pack? But you've got to start with one, then two, then three, then four. I think methods of queuing have visibly changed over the years. John, what have you noticed about this? Well, many moons ago, if you look in your clubs and you look at the old black and white photographs up on the wall, you'd have seen players like Joe Davis and Fred Davis, and when they queued, they had a very straight left arm. Right, and if I put the tip next to the cue ball here, and they played with a really straight left arm, when I go through the ball and I hit my chest, you can see I've only just gone past the cue ball there. Now, the modern method, of course, is to bend your left arm, have a little kink in there a little bit more, and what this does enables you to get through the ball. So if I put the tip next to the white again, bend the front arm a touch, I've got my elbow, pads on my hand and fingers on the bed, I move in and then go through and hit my chest, I've over doubled the distance through the ball. So what does that do? Well, it enables you to get plenty of action on the cue ball. So if you're playing in the club and you're struggling a little bit just to get a screw back, moving a little closer, bend that left arm, nice and smooth, this could go wrong by the way, <laughs> get it nice and smooth through the ball, half the effort, straight through the ball, I'm back down the table and I'm coming out of retirement. <laughs> Welcome back to my snooker surgery here in the practice room at uh, the Masters. Um, a difference between the two players, technique-wise. <clears throat> the theory says that the cue must be as parallel to the cloth as possible for the reason that if you put any accidental side spin on the cue ball, this will lessen the error. So you would hope on a shot that you would keep your cue as low as possible to the table as parallel. But actually, if you look at Mark Selby during the rest of this match, you'll find that on the big shots, especially, especially a screw back, his back end butt is well up in the air, quite high. So there's a lot of clearance from the cushion. When he goes through the ball, he's got room to drop 
away, like that. Graham Dot, very low on the shot. When he pulls back, his chin and the cue and the, and the cushion, not too much room for manoeuvre. Graham Dot in the past has had a, a plaster on his cue, on his chin, not too much room to manoeuvre. So the modern day players up at the, up at the back, room to manoeuvre, dropping the cue through, Ronnie O'Sullivan, Mark Selby, Sean Murphy playing like that, even though the theory books say that's not the way to play. It's a couple of routines. You've seen this probably before. This is called a line-up. So you get reds that go down the centre of the table. We've got a couple here, the other side of the blue, down to the pink, and generally the players will put them between pink and black and maybe a couple behind the spot. So that's a good little routine to get you going. Most of the players will use that to get warmed up. Great for screws and stuns and position. If you get to become a more advanced player, this routine here is fantastic. And the reason being, you have to pot the bottom red to get on the black and leave an angle so the other red now goes in the opposite pocket. So unless your position is of a high standard, you won't be able to pot the next red. This is a routine a lot of the top boys use, John Higgins certainly does. So once you pot that one, you want to be on position on the black, over there for the bottom one, that one will move and then this one pots. So you just keep doing that. Brilliant, brilliant for your maximum, maximum breaks. OK, safety now. What's the best way to practice safety? We get this a lot actually, John, don't we? Yeah, the thing with safety players, it's not the most riveting thing to practice, but it's very important. So there's, there are a couple of things you can do. If, you, if, you, if you're in the club and you, you want to play a bit of safety and you want to do something, make it a game, make it interesting, do a point system or something. What you're always trying to do when you play safe off a ball, obviously you, this is a shot to nothing, you try and knock it in, you want the cue ball to be near that cushion or somewhere close to it. So if you put a block of chalk somewhere like that, and that's your line to try and get behind, start off with the cue ball on the balk line. So you play a shot down the table, and you'll be playing a thin safety shot, and your intention is, obviously, if you can pot it, absolutely great. But if not, what you're trying to do is bring it down the table, Oh, look at that flick off the green, isn't that fantastic? Well, now, I'd get extra points for that because obviously I've got near it. So if you do a little point system with your pals and then you can move the cue ball further back, play from there, and then when you're really advanced, try playing off the cushion. And if you can get it in behind that block of chalk all the time, you can have a little game with your pals. I'm down here in the queue zone where I've grabbed the table. Um, Ken was talking in the studio and it's been mentioned in commentary about the importance of being the right side of the blue. And of course, here's a situation. We've got one red open. There's the pack of reds there mainly. Forget these for the moment. You've got a nice easy pot on the red. You want to get right side of the blue. OK, if you don't get the right side of the blue, you pot the white ball, it comes off the side cushion and you leave the cue ball the wrong side of the blue. Let's say you can get back down the table. The cue ball's got to travel into bulk. That's six feet. It's got to come back, come back up to the blue spot area. That's another six feet. And it may have another four feet to go before it gets down to the red you're trying to pot. That's, that's quite a lot. 16 feet of, of movement. Just counted that out quite nicely. If you get the right side of the blue, all of a sudden you've only got four feet for the cue ball to get down to this red. If there's no red there and all you've got is the pack of reds to continue, continue the break in, this area here on the table is the area you're trying to put the white ball in. So it becomes critical to get not only the right side of the blue, but a nice enough angle so you can pot that blue, smash into the pink. It's OK in your club tables. You can whack the red in, cue ball sort of pulls up quite quickly. On the fast cloths, all of a sudden, this becomes a bit of a frightening shot, especially if there's a bit of tension in the arm. So all of a sudden, to try and guarantee to get the right side of the blue and also keep it in that area becomes quite difficult. If you don't go, if you, if, you, if you hit it okay, it's all right, but if you go too far, then you've got one of the bulk colours. If you don't go far enough because you underhit it from tension, then you can't go into the pack of reds. So this area here is roughly where the players are looking to get it, but under pressure, with the tension in your arm, it's very difficult to get there, let alone try and pot the ball, as I did there. Answers for you. This one is from Jack Palmer from Harrow. He says, if I'm the wrong side of the blue, how do I play around the houses and the angles to get back into position to play the reds? Thank you in advance, young Master Davis. See this myself. Well, Jack, uh, you shouldn't be the wrong side of the blue. It's an awful thing to do. But should you find yourself the wrong side of the blue, it's a nightmare. But it does really depend on exactly where you are, the wrong side of the blue. Can you see these four crosses on the table? You'll need to experiment with this yourself. If you're quite wide on the blue, it's a, a fairly wide cut, 
their half ball cut. You have two choices. You can either go through the gap between the yellow and the brown, or the gap between the green and the blue, a bit between the green and the brown. So, this then depends upon which red you're playing for. It depends on the positional side. So there's two reds poking out the side of the pack. If you want to get position on this red, you perhaps go between the, the yellow and the brown with some screw and left-hand side, and all of a sudden the blue goes in the pocket, the side takes, and all of a sudden you come up that line along the line, so you're always on that red. Oh, I'm so happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, should that red not be there and you want to get on this red, that line's not so clever because you know, if you under hit it, you need the rest. If you over hit it, you're snookered. So you may play in between the green and the brown with right hand side so that when it comes off the cushion, you hopefully follow the line the same way. Wasn't particularly happy with that. <laughs> But hopefully, if you get in between, the cue ball comes down that line and is on that red for a lot longer. If you're a bit further round the table, all of a sudden, you might start to play this shot, what they call around the houses, okay? So, you're in a situation where, see this second cross here, you can play the blue, lots of top, loft of the left-hand side, round of the top side, bottom cushions, and back up the table again, like this. Round the table to come back into open play. But there is a position on the table that you do want to avoid playing that shot. If you're betwixt and between, you can cannon into the yellow. This is the worst scenario. Going around the table and cannon into the yellow. So don't try that if that's a particular shot. You've really got to experiment a lot with it, but you just know what you can do. Not to top fit for some, stun and side with the other ones. The key shots in that clearance was that this red along the bottom rail for Ricky Walden. And Kenny, you've been watching this, and this is a real art, isn't it, this particular shot? It is. I'm sort of setting up here now, but this actual shot that Ricky played, the shot on the TV there, was actually just a little bit off the cushion. Now, you may hear sometimes in commentary box that if the red is actually touching the cushion, it's a lot easier. And here's where I'll show you why. Ricky's shot wasn't touching the cushion, but this one is. And I'll show how the, the red just sticks to the cushion. Players would like the red, obviously, to be touching the cushion because it just makes it a little bit easier. And as I roll the red in, you will see how it just hugs to the cushion a little bit. It just goes into the pocket. It just makes the shot a little bit easier when the red or the object ball that you're playing is just holding the cushion and sticks to it a little bit more. Well, good clearance from Ricky Walden there. Indeed, which makes, of course, his shot, which was slightly fractionally out, from the cushion there, all the more impressive. That shot that he played on the pink, the pink was on the black spot. And Ken, Dorney, you were watching this one closely. It was a great shot going straight into the pack there. Yeah, beautiful shot. What we call is the arc shot. And here, here was the situation. Ricky had a full pack here. He's on the pink. And instead of, like, playing the cue ball just directly in a straight line off and into the pack to split the red. What he does, he hits it with lots of top spin. And what happens, the cue ball hits the pink, it hits here, it arcs into the pack, and what, the top spin takes the cue ball all the way through the pack and splits the reds. And that's how you get, it's the top spin that actually generates the, the pack to split open and subsequently won a frame. Great shot from Ricky Walden. Indeed, yeah. Hi, well, I'm down here in the cue zone. Uh, we saw Judd Trump uh, just fail on a break of 44, broke down. And sometimes you may hear in commentary, uh, the commentators will say about a flat pack. And a flat pack means, here you see, the four reds are in a line. And it's always very, very difficult to open a flat pack. And I'll tell you why, because the balls are so tight. We'll try and demonstrate what Judd was trying to, to do out there. He's trying to put the black into the corner and use a lot of top spin off the back cushion here and into the pack. And watch, watch what happens when you have a flat pack. You miss the pack completely. <laughs> and we'll just try it. We'll have another go there. We'll get the black out. Good man, Charles. When the balls are so tight together, you see what happens? The white gets stuck in the, in the reds. Now, we'll just try once more. When the balls are a little bit looser, you see they're much looser now, and then we'll try it again, and watch what happens. You see the way the white can come through the reds when they're a little bit looser. When it's a flat pack, the, white, the, the reds are all pretty tight together. It's very hard to get the cue ball through the pack. What have you noticed? Because Stephen was uh, in the commentary box mentioning the difference in styles between these two players. Yes, uh, obviously Ricky Warden's got a longer flowing cue action like a Ronnie O'Sullivan and Mark Allen's got a much shorter delivery and a pullback as well. We're talking about the pullback before the actual hit. So here's Ricky Warden's pullback. Bridge in place, cue ball in line with the yellow so I can put it back again. All of a sudden Ricky Britt for a screw back, pulls the cue back to the blue and then smoothly through the ball. Whereas Mark Allen 
has a much shorter pullback. I'm going to put the balls back, put the cue ball that next to the yellow. Mark Allen will only pull the cue back as far as the pink ball. Faster through the ball, but still you can screw the ball back. Which one's better? Well, it's a trade-off in a way. If you're too short, you're too jerky, and you may actually sort of reach for the shot. If you're too long, unnecessarily backswing. Difficult one to call, but in between is quite nice. The first one comes from Ryan in Armagh. I've been told to bring my bridge hand closer to the cue ball, but I've also been told to make sure that my bridge hand is well away from the cue ball, which is correct. Ken? Uh, it's quite an interesting. You'll see a lot of uh, players, uh, particularly in the club, sometimes they may, if, if you throw too much cue out here, you actually lose control of the cue. Of the cue. So a good barometer is probably about almost maybe two hands away from the cue ball because you're nice you don't want to be too close because you don't have much of a cue action but if you're sort of two sort of lengths of your own hand would be enough you know, if you're if you're too far back you see sometimes the cue wavers a little bit but somewhere around there is about average and that's just nice sometimes um, if you're uh, if you have a short shot you can have a shorter fraction of shorter bridge and the long shots you need a bit more of a pullback for a power shot so you can alter it doesn't have to be exactly the same for every one absolutely all right, guys, uh, who's going to take this one? This one's from Jake Bostock from Stoke-on-Trent, who says, when I play the cue ball and the target ball and they're extremely close to one another, what is the best way to avoid playing a push shot? Well, this is an example of what Steve was saying. This is actually uh, a particular shot where you can bring the cue and, and your bridge hand quite close to the cue ball. And sometimes, if, if, it's, if they're this close together, you may be able to raise your bridge hand as well, and it's sort of a, a short little... Uh, uh, backswing here. You don't need a long backswing, just a small little backswing and just something like that. So by raising raising the butt, you're effectively limiting the follow-through yes. a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you're you hitting down them. into the cloth Absolutely. rather than the ball. The only thing I've, I've thought about as well sometimes is well, actually when they're very close together, sometimes I've felt if, if you look at this red ball, Bizarrely, it makes it easier to hit it. I know the balls are really close together, but if you're having trouble with that shot, don't look at the white. Uh, experiment looking at the, the red as well. It's a very strange thing. It doesn't seem to make too much difference, but have a go yourself. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, Neil in Swansea has this scenario for us. Player attempts a pot, but it stops on the edge of the pocket. Player comes to the table to play shot. Ball drops into the pocket. What happens? Been trying to get an answer to this for 10 years. Well, this is a slightly different example of it, Neil. And this was actually with uh, Sean Murphy a few years ago. He's playing that red there, but keep your eye on the bottom right-hand corner, the black, just hovering over the edge, and in it pops. Now, it wasn't interfering with play, and the referee just put it straight back with no penalty. But this is quite an interesting one, guys. Isn't it? Have you got an answer for Neil on the more general and more specific questions of it? Yes. Well, that instance, uh, Neil, obviously the, the the ball, the black ball, wasn't touched by any other ball, and it comes under a rule we have in snooker called vi the vibration rule. So if a ball is teetering on the edge and it just drops in the pocket, the referee will put it back. If it's a ball that's come to, to, to rest after you try to pot it and it rests on the edge, then the referee, a bit like the golfing world, will, will give it a couple of beats to see. And if it looks like the, the ball's then stopped and then drops in afterwards, then that can be considered the vibration rule. So the, the, obviously the floor at the crucible is balls. You know, it's, it's, it's a theatre from many years ago. OK, this is a concrete floor here in the Winter Gardens. <laughs> Pretty solid, but there is a possibility to knock this black in. <laughs> or not. Come in. <laughs> but if the floor's not solid, sometimes this happens a bit, so the referees have to be aware of that. <laughs> the table is pretty solid as well. <laughs> I think Mr Davis is going to retire hurt after that. Uh, this one's from Rob Nolan in Birmingham, who says, I play snooker every weekend against my dad. Most of the time I win. Good on you. Uh, but I seem to struggle when playing the cue ball from the rail or cushion. Can you please help me? Apologies, uh, your name again, sorry. This was Rob Nolan from Birmingham. Rob, uh, okay, sorry about that, Rob. Okay, what happens is if you're close to the cushion, and we've got the cue cam here, a special bit of technology, look, if you keep the cue as low as you would on other shots, look how much you can see of the white ball, not too much. And it's very easy that if you're hitting on the top of that ball and your cue is very low down at the back, to slip across the top and miss cue, okay? The way to do it... Just raise the butt of the cue a little bit more, so effectively you can see more of the cue ball, and then hopefully, even though I haven't taught my tip, hopefully <laughs> you can hit the ball. Also, make sure you keep as still as possible, and make sure you chalk the cue, chalk the tip before every shot off the cushion.